After 80 years, the once lost submarine is now found. For a while, the mystery of the USS Grenion was one that seemed like it would remain unsolved. For more than 80 years, no one knew what happened to the submarine or its 69-man crew. With time, what used to be a tragic loss became little more than an interesting footnote in the history books. But for a certain few, the fate of the Grunion is a lot more personal. The mere passage of time wasn't enough to get the proper closure they needed. One particular family's determination led them on a journey to uncover the truth about Grunion. It also inspired them to make a rather unexpected move once they got their answers. This is the story of one family whose mission was to uncover the story of a war submarine and, more importantly, their father. The USS Grenion was a Gato-class submarine that operated during World War II in Alaska's Aleutian Islands. The Grenion was reported to have been attacked by Japanese anti-submarine squads, but somehow it managed to avoid sinking. In July 1942, it was moved to the Kiska Island, where the Grunion sank two enemy patrol boats. Then, on 30 July 1942, the submarine mysteriously sank, leaving no record of activity. The reasons for the sinking remained a mystery, that is, until 2007, when the shipwreck was discovered. While the bulk of the wreckage was identified, the bow of the submarine was still missing. The researchers eventually found the bow, but it turns out there's a lot more to the story. About three years after USS Grenion, SS-216, was found near the Aleutian Islands, a man named Bruce Abele, now 80 years old, was still puzzled over the sinking of his father's submarine during those days of World War II. In 2006, Abele and two of his younger brothers, John and Brad, made the news. The ocean surveying firm they hired to search the Bering Sea floor sent them a photo of an oblong object. This object had featured a resembling conning tower and periscope mask. The following summer, a remotely operated vehicle, ROV, indeed confirmed the same object as the wreckage of a U.S. submarine. Finally, the Abelli brothers got answers to the decades-old mystery of what happened to their father, Lieutenant Commander Mannert Abelli, and his 69-man crew. Ever since, experts have been poring over photos and video footage of the discovery. Theories have been suggested as to what caused Grenion's sinking in the first place. Okay, so the ship was found. But that doesn't explain how or why the USS Grenion sank. What was clear, however, was that the submarine went below crush depth and essentially imploded. What's also visible in the photos is a channel that was left from its descent down an underwater slope. The rear dive plane is clearly in dive position, and that tells us they lost depth control, Bruce Abelli explained. But why? What happened? There's one account by a Japanese officer who was aboard the freighter Kano Maru. The officer claimed that after being torpedoed by an American submarine north of Kiska, he and his crew saw ripples in the water and fired their deck gun, hitting its conning tower. Bruce said how they originally thought a three-inch shell hit the shears, which are the supporters that hold the periscope. Recently, though, we met Commander Charlie Tate, who did eight war patrols on Gato, which was the sister ship of the Grenion. Tate told the Abelli brothers that the damage to the shears was not caused by a three-inch shell, but by something a lot bigger. Right now, according to Bruce, the hypothesis they're leaning on is that this was a circular torpedo that never exploded. If that's the case, then the Kano Maru shot at a washing wave that happened to be caused by the bubble that rose to the surface of the water when the Grenion imploded underneath. That also means that a jammed rear drive plane in combination with a disruption would have left the submarine unable to blow its ballast tanks and plummet fast. In August 1942, the U.S. Navy recognized the Grenion as missing. For them, it was another war casualty, one of many. But for the Abellis, it meant they never got to say goodbye to their father, whom everyone called Jim. He would take his boys to lunch at the officers' club at the submarine base in Groton, Connecticut. He chose to spend time with his sons and show them where Daddy works. And Daddy's work was pretty important. He was on a classified mission in the North Pacific. 
Bruce recalled not seeing him a great deal because he was always at sea. Even when he was lost, we didn't hear about that until September 30th, 1942. It was kind of almost a paperwork thing. But as time went on, the loss of their father started to have an impact on the boys. As the years passed, Brad started compiling what these brothers call the gym book. When the USS Grenion disappeared, Bruce was 12, Brad was 9, and John was 5. Originally, the boys wrote the gym book for family and friends, describing the Abelli's memories of their dad, the Naval Academy graduate who loved soccer. They also wrote about what it was like growing up with him. The book even includes notes from students who learned from Jim Abelli at NROTC at Harvard. One of the students, Endicott Chubb Peabody, was a defensive lineman on the football team who later became the governor of Massachusetts. Peabody credited Abelli as having inspired him to serve on submarines. As time passed, the gym book continued to be opened and read, only fueling the Abelli family's curiosity. What the heck happened to their father? That story would become the Abelli brothers' groundbreaking quest to find the Grenion that began in 1998. It was after Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard Lane purchased a wiring diagram of a winch from the Japanese Kano Maru for a dollar at an antique store in Denver. Since Lane was hoping to learn more about the ship, he posted a question online a few years later in 2001. Lane got a reply from a Japanese historian and translator named Yutaka Iwasaki, saying the diagram was authentic and that he thinks he knows what happened to the USS Grenion. It turns out that Iwasaki found and translated an old article published in a 60s Japanese maritime journal by a naval officer who served on the Kano Maru. The article described the Kano Maru's battle with a submarine near Kiska. Lane then took Iwasaki's information and contacted Commander Submarining Pacific Fleet, Com Subpack, because they had a website dedicated to the Grenion. Around that time, Bruce's son's fiance showed the gym book to her boss, who happened to be a World War II history buff. After seeing the sentimental book, he sent Bruce a list of Grunion-related websites. I'd seen them all before, and I almost didn't take a look, he admitted. Then I saw the post from Yutaka Iwasaki, saying he thinks he knows what happened to the Grunion, and, most important, a rough idea of where it was. That was huge. The Abellis looked for Iwasaki's email address, which wasn't easy to find. They searched through a string of 70 messages, and John finally found one from Iwasaki. He sent a message to the man, asking if he was the one who knew what happened to the Grenion. Finally, he received a reply. It is me. I have prayed for repose for your father's soul. Now that the brothers had knowledge of the submarine's approximate location, they got serious about finding it. John, who had founded Boston Scientific, the global manufacturer and marketer of medical devices, suggested they bring in Robert Ballard of Titanic fame. They reached out to Ballard, but he declined to participate. Although Ballard turned them down, he did give them a kindergarten course in finding a sub, Bruce said. He told the brothers to start with wide-scan sonar, which can cover a swath width of two or three miles at a time. Then, they should send down an ROV. And so they did just that. In August 2006, the Abellis hired Seattle's Williamson & Associates to conduct sonar scans of the Aleutian Islands. They spanned an area of about 250 square miles. An Alaskan crabbing boat called the Aquila ferried all the equipment. They were sending us emails every day, and I was getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to see what was going on, Bruce recalled. A week into their deep-sea search, the scans detected a long, narrow silhouette, 3,200 feet deep. While it was 20 feet shorter than the Grunion was, the object still seemed to have a curious appendage that looked like the propeller guards found on submarines of that type. Before the expedition started, Iwasaki had contacted the Abellis. He told them that he visited Japan's military archives and found there a chart listing the precise coordinates of the submarine. It was almost right on the money, Bruce said, referring to the location they were given. After being certain that they'd found what they were looking for, the Abellis went back a year later. In 2007, the Abellis sent Aquila back to the same spot, but this time with an ROV. 
Almost immediately, in return images of a terribly damaged submarine, there was a 50-foot section of its bow missing. Pipes and hoses were exposed, as well as interior bunks and a dive wheel, and the aft battery hatch had been blown wide open. With water pressure at 1,300 pounds per square inch, the Grunion simply imploded. There's no question about what happened, Bruce stated. At least now, they were getting some real answers. The discovery of the submarine prompted a search for the families of Grunion's crew, and the crew wasn't small. There were 69 men on that submarine. For the task of finding the families of the Grenion crew, the Abellis hired round-the-clock help from three women they decided to call the Subladies. Their names were Mary Bentz from Bethesda, Vicki Rogers from Mayfield, and Rhonda Ray from Cartersville. The women were all relatives of the men who died on the Grenion. Bentz had lost her uncle, Carmine Perizelli. Rogers had lost her great-uncle, Merritt Graham and Ray lost her great-uncle, Paul Edward Baines, to the submarine sinking. Together, these women spent two years of their lives tracking down everyone of Grunion's 69 families. They searched through genealogy files, phone books, marriage records, and obituaries in the newspapers. On the very same day that the submarine's wreckage was found by the ROV, Mary Bentz went on a Detroit radio talk show. She did it so she could ask listeners if anyone might know relatives of seaman Byron Travis of Michigan. The Travises were the only family she wasn't able to locate. Amazingly, the wife of Travis's cousin was listening to that radio station that day and heard the broadcast. So, of course, she called in. I have his purple heart hanging on my dining room wall, she said to Bentz. The subladies also used a large amount of letters from Jim Abelli's wife to families of the Grenion crew. Bruce mentioned how his mother was extremely disciplined. After they got notification of Grenion's loss, his mother hand-wrote a condolence note to every single one of the next of kin. And when Jim got the Navy Cross, his mother wrote a second note. We have three large loose-leaf notebooks, all organized by a crew member with all of the correspondence that went back and forth, Bruce explained. You can't read that stuff with a dry eye. It's just incredible. Now that Grunion's families had been located, Benz started calling the local newspapers of each crewman requesting an article or obituary. Benz's focus at that point was to have them honored in every possible place. Benz included the World War II Registry, the Navy Memorial, and the National Purple Heart Hall of Honor in New York. But in 2008, Brad Abelli passed away just a few months before 200 relatives of the Grenion crew gathered for a memorial service aboard USS Cod in Cleveland. It's a shame he wasn't there to make it, considering he was a large piece of the puzzle. During the memorial, as the crew's names were being read, Grenion's own bell rang. It had been removed before battle because of its weight and was laid in a scrap heap at Pearl Harbor until the 50s. A certain chaplain asked if he could keep it. And so he took it home to Greenville, Mississippi, but later donated it to the city's visitor center. It turns out that one of the Grenion's crewmen, Edward Knowles, was from Greenville. His sister, Geraldine Kendrick, informed Bruce about the bell, and arrangements were made to have it borrowed for the memorial. According to Bruce, the whole Grenion saga is filled with such coincidences. The journey has also been healing. Before it sank, the Grenion sank two Japanese subchasers. Iwasaki was able to find the widow of one of the sub-chasers, Commanders, who is now 99 years old. The Abellis sent her flowers from Kiska Island. As a token of her appreciation, she sent them a hand-woven gift to the sons of Catherine E. Abelli.